It is 1900 GMT. That is 10 p.m. in Gaza, in Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. Now, in Gaza, Palestinian homes continue to be targeted by airstrikes. An Israeli army spokesman has described it as the largest ever bombardment of Gaza. We've also heard from the spokesman of Hamas's military wing. He said that the group will begin executing Israeli captives if Israel bombs civilian houses in Gaza without any pre-warning. And speaking just a few minutes ago, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that a number of Palestinian gunmen are still active inside Israel. Now, a warning to our viewers that the pictures you're about to see from Gaza and from the destruction that took place today are disturbing. These are the scenes from Jabalia neighborhood in the north of the Gaza Strip. There are reports of mass casualties there. 687 Palestinians, including 140 children and 900 Israelis, have been killed in the most serious escalation in violence in decades. Israel has also declared a total blockade of the Gaza Strip. That means cutting off food, fuel, water, and electricity. Palestine's health ministry says Israeli strikes are targeting hospitals. The Jabalia camp is the largest of eight refugee camps in the Strip, densely packed with more than 116,000 refugees. Not too far away from the camp is a UN-run elementary school, though it was not impacted by Monday's airstrike. It is still not clear how many people died in that strike in Jabalia. Let's take a closer look at how events unfolded in Gaza. Rasul Sardar reports. In Khashmal, in Mazon, no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel for Gaza, says Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Home to nearly two and a half million people, the Gaza Strip has been under an air, land and sea blockade imposed by Israel since 2007. But now it has even cut off the basics. The Israeli army is bombarding the besieged enclave after Hamas's unprecedented attack on Israel. Israel hit more than 1,000 targets in Gaza, including airstrikes that leveled much of the town of Beit Hanun in the enclave's northeast corner. Israel formally declared war on Gaza on Sunday and is promising more destruction. We're fighting against human animals and we're acting accordingly. Israeli airstrikes also targeted Jabalia, the largest of the Gaza Strip's eight refugee camps. The camp is only 1.4 square kilometers in size, but it is home to nearly 120,000 Palestinians. We're here in the heart of Jabalia. As you can see the destruction in the camp. We're here in the trans roundabout. As you can see, Dozens have been murdered. This is what's happening in Gaza. Destruction is everywhere in Gaza. Once bustling with worshippers, this mosque is now barely recognizable from air. Civilians are mainly the ones who are paying the price. Hundreds have already been killed and thousands injured. Those who survived now have nowhere to go. I live in the house away from my family. I ran away from home at 1 o'clock in the morning, along with my child and my wife. We escaped from being targeted and came to another targeted place. We were surprised by everything, as fire and flames were thrown at us. There is no safe place in the Gaza Strip. Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas in the world, has one of the poorest infrastructures due to the Israeli blockade. What is left of residential areas, towers, hospitals and the whole infrastructure is being destroyed now. Gaza has seen several wars, but Palestinians say Israeli attacks on the city are now turning into a collective punishment. Rasul Serdar, Al Jazeera. Tarek Abu Azoum, you are live inside Gaza and can tell us what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Since I last spoke to you, we all saw multiple bombardments on Gaza. What can you tell us at this stage? 
Well, uh, the bombardment of, of the Gaza Strip continues despite the warning that has been released by the official spokesman of the uh, militant group Hamas, saying that uh, after the destruction of every Palestinian house without pre-warnings, uh, an Israeli captive will be executed. Now, the Israeli occupation forces during the past hours uh, leveled to the ground uh, two residential uh, buildings uh, in the cities of Khan Yunus and uh, Rafah, southern the Gaza Strip, which put us in uh, a very clear option that we might see in the next hours the uh, scenes and the photos of execution that might be spread on the social media platforms as well. Now, according to the uh, Palestinian Ministry of Education, uh, or, I'm sorry, the Palestinian Ministry of uh, Health inside the uh, Gaza Strip, the number of Palestinians killed has jumped severely to reach around 687 uh, killed. Uh, the uh, majority of those uh, were uh, children, including 140 kids and more than 100 uh, women. And the rate also of the wounded people had approximately done to reach around 3,726 wounded uh, citizens inside the, Ga the Gaza Strip. A 10% of those uh, were kids. Now, uh, the Gaza Strip has uh, witnessed uh, during the last uh, hour uh, and a dozen a number of uh, airstrikes, uh, specifically that the uh, main uh, central medical complex inside the Gaza Strip, a Shifa hospital, was partially uh, affected from the Israeli uh, ongoing uh, attacks, that the roof of one of the medical rooms had fallen over the patient's head, and even the uh, medical capacity of the hospital is not yet enough to receive more uh, cases inside uh, the, uh, the hospital, and that really adds such a great pressure to the medical capabilities of the enclave to, uh, to, to uh, tolerate the incoming hours and even to accept more, uh, let's say, cases. Now, uh, before uh, we go live on right now, the uh, Israeli occupation announced that water will be uh, cut uh, uh, from the Gaza Strip. Now, no water supplies will be provided to the Gaza Strip. Add to that that even the fuel supply to the Gaza Strip was suspended throughout the shuttering of areas and Kerem Shalom borders. Even the Egyptian side did not provide, mm -hmm. till this current moment, any medical or even humanitarian mm -hmm. help to the uh, Gaza Strip, which really can accelerate and exacerbate the current conditions of Palestinians, About who that, are the majority of them are displaced and the others are absolutely live in threat. About that, Tarek, do and I know it's difficult to put a, a number on this, or do you know how long most residents in Gaza will be able to hold out with no more food and water coming into the Gaza Strip? Well, uh, the uh, the Gaza Strip is experienced a, a great shortage of uh, necessities and even essential items. Now, the Gaza Strip can uh, peer up for the coming uh, few days, but if this crisis will last for a long time, the ability of the Gaza Strip to peer up the current situation won't remain for a long time due to the fact that the Israeli occupation is very keen to deteriorate the economic and even the humanitarian condition in the Gaza Strip. Now, the majority of crossing borders are controlled by the Israeli side and main, in fact, the Israeli authorities since the early eruption of this round of fighting between both parts prevented the entry of essential items such as fuel or even medical uh, necessities for the uh, medical uh, field. Also, different calls have been released. Oh, my gosh. Oh, 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 that's really, that's really strong right now. A building has been leveled to the ground uh, inside the Gaza strip main effect in the front of our eyes right now we're, see, uh, we're seeing it really, I think on a uh, slight delay from I... time and other hand the fumes right now is uh, is, is just uh, getting out from the the place right now yeah Tarek I think you're I think we're seeing and the camera is moving now uh, what you just described uh, we're probably on a 10 second delay that's often the case with these feeds can you tell us where roughly in the Gaza Strip that might have happened, just based on what you're hearing and where you're standing. 
Right, uh, we are standing right now on the coastal line of the Gaza Strip, the main coastal uh, strait in the Gaza Strip near the beach. Uh, uh, absolutely, this uh, this airstrike was close to the compound of Ansar, uh, which is uh, close to the uh, governmental compound uh, inside the Gaza Strip. Now, the explosion was uh, severe, and even uh, the, uh, the 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 fumes of the explosion now uh, is uh, is just getting out from mm. the, the the place. So, Tarek, I have to ask you, because um, you, you know, we opened this hour, obviously carrying the news that Hamas's military wing had said that each time a civilian home is bombed by Israel in the Gaza Strip without prior warning, they would execute one of the uh, people that they're holding captives. Um, do you have any idea if the multiple targets that we've seen hit over the last hours on this live feed, do you have any idea if they have been receiving those warnings? Well, till this current moment, there is no uh, any uh, proof that uh, or evidence that the destroyed houses receive warnings or not, because no official uh, authorities has announced that. But it could be really clear in the coming hours if there is any execution will be carried mm. out for any of the Israeli captives. It will be a clear sign that one of the buildings really did not receive any kind of pre-warnings. But to this current moment, usually the Israeli army try to uh, strike the uh, the house with a small missile in order to warn its mm. dwellers to evacuate. But at the current moment, the majority of houses are being hit directly without even sending any pre-warning. So it could be sometimes hard to determine if this house could be uh, clearly received any uh, warning before the, uh, the time of uh, striking. Yeah, look, that's a very useful reminder because some of our viewers will know this, others won't, that often, not always, but often there is a warning strike. Sometimes it's a phone call by the Israelis themselves to the area or the building that they're about to hit, and sometimes it's a warning strike that gives people just a few minutes, just a short amount of time to leave the area before the real strike, before the missile that delivers the actual payload that does all the destruction. Um, Tarek uh, Abouazoum, live for us inside Gaza, thank you very much for all your reporting. We'll come back to you. Now, there's been a flare-up also on a separate front that we have to tell you about. That's on Israel's border with Lebanon. The Palestinian armed group Islamic Jihad has claimed responsibility for an incursion into northern Israel from Lebanon. And separately, Lebanon's Hezbollah says five of its members were killed during Israeli shelling in southern Lebanon, and a vast forest fire began on the Israeli side of the border near Lebanon after the confrontations. It's unclear at this moment how the fire started. Ali Hashem is joining us live from southern Lebanon. Ali, I think all of this really begs for some explanation on who's doing what, where, and what the possible repercussions might be. So um, let's start, first of all, with the fires. Let's start there, and we can probably put up the pictures. Uh, I don't know if they're live or if the pictures that we had from about 30, 40 minutes ago. Um, but there's a fire at the border area between Israel and Lebanon. What is that? What does it mean? What consequences could it have? Well, Cyril, this uh, fire is after Israeli uh, air, uh, airplanes strike uh, the, the open space on the border between Lebanon and, and Israel. Um, why? Because a group of uh, Palestinian fighters from the Islamic Jihad infiltrated the, the borders and uh, engaged in a battle with the Israeli army. So following that, the Israeli army started hitting uh, the open spaces, agricultural lands, uh, in, a, in a bit to deny uh, fighters cover just in case there, there, there is any future infiltrations. This is one. now, And, and that's why we are seeing all this, this fire, the huge fires on, on the borders. Now, there's another uh, uh, thing that's, that's been happening, and, and I think that's very significant. The Israelis also hit three po posts for Hezbollah, a uh, Lebanese militant group fighting from South Lebanon, and it's, it's the strongest, actually, group, and maybe the only group, Lebanese group, that's uh, present uh, in, in South Lebanon. Now, over the past 48 hours, the Lebanese front was... Um, a space for exchanging messages mm. and not more than that. And that's why the Lebanese front was 
uh, a kind of uh, a, a, an area that's not part of the conflict. Now, with uh, the situation that's uh, uh, unraveling and, and, and the escalation in, in tension, it seems that the Lebanese uh, uh, front is entering this conflict. Why? Uh, now, just a few minutes ago, Hezbollah, the Lebanese group, uh, issued a statement announcing that several of its fighters were killed today in Israeli shellings. And uh, I'm trying to read from the statement and that uh, following this incident, uh, the Islamic resistance carried out an initial response by attacking the Pranit Barracks, which serves as the command center for the Galilee Brigade, and the Avivim Barracks, a command center for the Western Brigade, and that this was done using um, anti-tank missiles and mortar shells, and that there were some direct hits. So now we're seeing this tension between Hezbollah and Israel mounting gradually and going towards a space where Lebanon is becoming the new, maybe, uh, place where all the eyes are on to see whether this whole conflict is taking a new dimension. Because the mm. dimension with Hezbollah entering this conflict is that it's not anymore just a, a, a Palestine-Israel uh, 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 conflict, rather a kind of a semi-regional uh, conflict. And th this could be very big. Absolutely. Ali Hashem reporting from uh, southern, from the uh, Israel-Lebanon border area in southern Lebanon. Thank you very much. I want to bring in now Elias Farhat. Even as we continue to watch the skies over Gaza, the aftermath of that strike we saw maybe about five, ten minutes ago. Elias Farhat, you're a former Lebanese army general. I want to follow up on the point that Ali was making. Do you believe that Hezbollah is ramping up its presence in this conflict as we speak? Uh, let's, let me draw your attention that uh, uh, yesterday Hezbollah uh, sent messages through bombing uh, uh, targets in Sheba farms, which Lebanon claims that it's, uh, uh, it's a Lebanese territory, while today they bombed uh, uh, Branit and uh, Avivim, which uh, Lebanon do, does not claim it is a Lebanese territory, but it is an Israeli uh, uh, territory. So. The, the the clash of today is a completely different, politically at least, uh, from each other. Uh, now, uh, I think so what's that the message? we are still in—now, in, 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 uh, I think that uh, the five uh, warriors of Hezbollah who they claimed were killed in a press release, uh, likely, people say likely, they were in an observation co uh, post and that was hit by Israel. And Hezbollah responded by launching ro rockets and mortars to uh, two sites in Israel, in Branit and in Avivim, uh, just moving the uh, uh, rules of engagement to another place. But I think that the, 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 this, the, the concept of the rules of engagement will continue uh, That's uh, to fire at a target, and the other part, the Israeli, will respond on the source of the fire. There is no uh, idea, I think, and no uh, body, uh, both sides uh, think about uh, expanding the, the front of uh, confrontation uh, between each other. So far, okay. it is uh, restricted on uh, definite targets. Okay, that is, uh, that's very interesting context and analysis. So can I get you then to consider what's happening uh, in the rest of Israel, they are calling up 300,000 reservists, which is unprecedented. We are we saw earlier today the footage of the troop buildup uh, near Gaza. Now, when he spoke moments ago, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said airstrikes are just the beginning. So when you factor that line in and you factor in the 300,000 reservists that are being called up, does that say to you that there's definitely going to be a ground offensive? What does it say to you? Yes, uh, news, in the news we heard that uh, Netanyahu called President Biden and said that, that he has no choice but to launch a ground offensive. A ground offensive to be launched, uh, the, uh, the, there should be a ground forces uh, in a structure of uh, uh, the brigades or uh, uh, divisions. Uh, now, uh, Netanyahu, uh, the Minister of Defense, 
uh, recalled 300,000, which is unprecedented. Uh, they need time uh, in order uh, to, uh, for ranks and files to go to their right position in each uh, unit in Israel, mm. uh, and then uh, to uh, start establishing the command and control system and uh, uh, the, the equipment of all uh, uh, the, the ranks and files and uh, start, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to, to experience this uh, new, uh, the new uh, structure of, uh, uh, of units in order to get ready uh, to uh, go to the ground uh, offensive. I think this operation uh, is a routine operation, but it needs the time uh, of at least two weeks, of, uh, even more than two weeks, in order uh, to bring up those 300,000 into organized units that can uh, be pushed to, uh, to the uh, uh, theater of operations. But, uh, Elias, a ground offensive in Gaza for the Israeli military, that's not favorable terrain for them, is it? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the ground offensive, uh, uh, I think that they have a contingency, contingency plans, pre-prepared plan uh, to, uh, to be executed by uh, the uh, new, uh, uh, new units that are uh, recalled from the reserves. Uh, now, uh, the, the, uh, the, the operation will uh, start by retaking the uh, seven or eight uh, settlements that are still uh, uh, Hamas fighters uh, uh, clashes with the Israeli uh, forces. And after retaking the seven uh, settlements, then they will approach to the borders with Gaza, and we will get another situation now. Uh, there will be, uh, I mean, an axis of progress for the forces, and some uh, forces advanced on uh, many, ma many axes. That depends upon the uh, uh, the, the plan of operation mm. and uh, what the, what the, the military command aims from this operation is to uh, even to divide Gaza to two parts or three parts or uh, or, or to destroy Gaza or to level it on, uh, to, to level it on the ground <laughs> as some uh, uh, Ben Gafir and the Smotrich say. So we don't know exactly uh, the plan, but. Uh, we can predict the uh, ground operations uh, targets when uh, the uh, Israel retake the seven settlements uh, uh, that are still uh, uh, fa uh, face uh, a fight between uh, Hamas fighters and the Israeli army. Okay, one thing that you're saying that I, I just hadn't thought of is how long it takes to prepare something like this. So. You seem to be suggesting if there is to be a ground offensive, it's probably not going to be tomorrow or even the day after tomorrow. It might take 10 days, two weeks to put that plan into action. I mean, uh, as a professional Israeli military command uh, will not uh, get involved in uh, an offensive without uh, bringing uh, many units uh, uh, to a high degree of preparedness uh, to intervene uh, and to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to establish another line of uh, uh, of forces that will follow the the, the front line, which will will attack uh, uh, the, the borders of Gaza uh, and uh, to establish mm. a reserve uh, in order to use it. Uh, in case of any troubles in, in, in the, the fight, and to establish a, a rear area which uh, uh, will be used to support uh, the, the units while they are advancing. It is some, so, some sophisticated uh, military uh, uh, business, uh, which uh, I think that the, the, the military command uh, are aware of it. So uh, it's not easy, and it's, uh, it is impossible to see a ground offensive within the coming days. It needs weeks. It needs weeks. All right. That's, uh, that's interesting perspective, useful perspective. Former Lebanese Army General Elias Farhad, thank you for joining us this hour. Now, oh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has addressed the nation after a third night of airstrikes on Gaza. He says the strikes have only just begun. He also said that a number of Palestinian gunmen are still inside Israel. I'm confirming that we have started attacking Hamas. What you're seeing is just the beginning. We have killed many of those fighters. Every place where Hamas is active and working will be completely destroyed. 
and we will continue to intensify operations. Let's get more on the latest uh, with Sarah Hayrat. You are live in West Jerusalem for us, Sarah. So an important development for uh, Israelis. Their prime minister just addressed the nation. He was calling for national unity, and he compared this to what happened during the Six-Day War in 1967, which is obviously a major date in Israel's history when they gained uh, militarily conquered a lot of territory. What were the highlights of the Netanyahu speech from where you're standing? Let's just listen to some of the kind of uh, strong language that's used, that uh, strikes in Gaza are only the beginning. We will in intensify our attacks in the coming days, so we, that's clearly the direction they're heading in. Every place Hamas operates from will turn into ruin. Um, so the kind of language, you know, ruin, and um, uh, saying that uh, this will resonate for, with generations to come. And as you were mentioning when we were talking earlier, you were saying about how um, this is just this is for uh, to, for the region, you know. So he, he also talked about um, how they have international uh, uh, support. Um, so the message, even though it was addressed to uh, the Israeli public, but he's also sending a message further outwards to the rest of the world. It's obviously got a huge uh, backing from the Western world, that's for sure. Um, and that kind of strong language is is you know he wants to be. Uh, to be seen as the person that's taking this country forward, especially at a time when there's been so much divisions under the coalition government that he uh, was mm. almost forced to form with these far-right uh, 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 ministers and parties to come back into power. And, of course, now he is the longest-serving prime minister. But just a few weeks ago, there'd been um, protests in the thousands by Israelis against him and some of the decisions that this government uh, was taking. And, of course, uh, a lot of the tension that's been uh, happening in this last year that it has been blamed on the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, force that uh, the, the current government is pushing towards an expansion of settlements and more demolitions and pushing Palestinians out of their home. And as a result, um, there have been increased tensions uh, since his new government came into power. And now now he is able, in, with such a strong message, uh, you know, to appease the Israeli public as well and, 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 and let them know that he is taking but, this uh, forward, especially now that he uh, is being given more powers when it comes to this war clause that we also have been talking about. Um, just sorry to, to add to explaining to that to our viewers, which is an article that um, hasn't been used since the war, uh, October 6th war in 1976. And that's allowing himself and the defence minister to be able to make decisions um, uh, with regards to this without having to consult the cabinet every time. But what's the opposition saying about this? Are they willing to sign a blank check for the prime minister and his defence minister to prosecute this war any way they see fit? Well... Interestingly, um, we've uh, been hearing and seeing at the moment that um, they have met today. Um, they've, uh, Pr uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, has uh, said that he's pushing now for uh, the opposition to come into the fold. Uh, also a sign of unity that the country comes together despite their political differences. We know that the opposition leader, uh, Yair Lapid, a few days ago was the first person to suggest this emergency unity government that would include opposition members, but a couple of the uh, opposition party leaders had stipulated that they wanted um, certain conditions, if you like, to uh, consider that, and it seems that they would create a war cabinet where the opposition uh, had more involvement in that uh, decision-making. The response, it seems, from uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is that no conditions uh, 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 will be met as such, that he wants it without any preconditions. So mm. it seems that no decision has been made just yet on an emergency unity government, but it's definitely something that they're, uh, all sides are considering at the moment. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, rockets have continued to be fired uh, during the day from the Gaza Strip. 
What have you seen of that in and around Jerusalem? Well, there have been a couple of incidences uh, today, certainly in uh, Jerusalem with the air sirens, one which was late uh, in the morning, and then I think uh, further uh, sort of late afternoon that lasted a little bit longer. The first round um, didn't seem to have any uh, damage caused anywhere. They were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome, which is an anti-missile system. And then the second round actually hit four different areas, one uh, being in occupied uh, West Bank, on an Israeli settlement. Um, again, as I was mentioning earlier, these Israeli settlements, which are being uh, pushed forward uh, and approved by uh, some uh, ministers in this government, including the uh, National Security Minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir, and it seems to have uh, um, uh, targeted this rocket, this area. Um, there had been a few casualties just at, uh, uh, south and uh, north of uh, west, rather, I think it was of, uh, sorry, north of Jerusalem. Um, but if you actually go out onto the streets, Cyril, um, they're extremely quiet. Um, people, whether they're Israelis or, of course, Palestinians and occupied East Jerusalem. They're staying indoors. Um, the whole of the old city um, is closed off uh, from tourists in terms of being able to visit the holy sites. Uh, Christmas is a couple of months away, so there are many Christian pilgrims coming from all around the world, um, and a lot of them have uh, had to leave, and there are evacuation plans in place for uh, many nationals also living here. Um, in fact, I'd been speaking to even even some of our colleagues that have uh, grown up in uh, Jerusalem, and they've told me that um, it, this is the quietest they've seen, certainly, mm. uh, since the pandemic a couple of years ago, with everything being so quiet. And really, it comes down to people just waiting um, and staying indoors to stay safe because of a fear of tensions um, between, for example, Israeli settlers or uh, from the Palestinian side. Sarah Hayrat reporting from West Jerusalem at the moment. Thank you very much, Sarah. I want to go to Imran Khan, who... Imran, you're in Ramallah. You're in the occupied West Bank. Uh, it, I noted during the speech by Benjamin Netanyahu that he said, we are re reinforcing all fronts, and that includes Lebanon and, in his words, the West Bank. Is that something that you have seen? Is that something that you can comment on? Well, Cyril, it's an effective blockade here. They've, uh, the Israelis have cut off, uh, not just within uh, the uh, occupied West Bank, but they've actually cut off the occupied West Bank completely to the outside world. There's a broader crossing that takes you from uh, the occupied West Bank into Jordan, the Allenby Bridge crossing. That's actually completely shut now. Thousands of people are stranded on either side of that border. They were trying to get across. There was a few hours where they, where they could get across, and then about two thirds local time in the afternoon, they shut that down. Uh, all of the checkpoints, including the main one of Kalandia, uh, which takes you from Ramallah into Jerusalem, that's been shut down as well. Nobody is being allowed in or out. My cameraman, just to give you a personal example, my cameraman Joseph is actually a resident of Bethlehem. He can't get to Ramallah. Mm. Within the occupied West Bank, you can't move around. Effectively, 3.2 million uh, Palestinians have been stopped from moving around within uh, the occupied West Bank. This is, like I say, an effective blockade. But still, there have been protests throughout the day. Those pro some of those protests have actually turned deadly. Uh, the death toll and the injury toll seems to be rising as the hours go by. We're hearing that another five people have been injured, bringing up to about 45 people since uh, Saturday. At least 17 people have been killed as Israeli forces have stopped, have opened fire on unarmed protesters. Those protesters, Cyril, are out. Um, giving support and showing support to Hamas and the Hamas operation. Uh, but there is a sense of nervousness here right now. Everybody's watching those uh, scenes on TV that we are as well, and they're looking at the bombardment of Gaza. They've never seen anything like it before, and they're worried. They're actually stocking up on food in various parts of uh, the West Bank, particularly in the more remote areas. They're stocking up on food because they simply don't know what might be coming next. But as all of that goes on, there's also another fear from the Palestinians living near those uh, illegal settlements under uh, Israeli law that dot mm. the West Bank. People living near there are afraid of settler attacks as well. 
So that's where we're at right now. Um, and President, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whose words won't come as a surprise, but they'll certainly add to the nervousness here. Yeah, so people stocking up on food in the occupied West Bank. Israelis told to stock up on basics for 72 hours across Israel. And the only people who can't stock up on anything are the people in Gaza, with the Israeli authorities having uh, tightened their blockade. No food, no water, no electricity entering Gaza there. Imran Khan reporting from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Thank you very much. We're going to take a very short break on Al Jazeera. We come back with continuing coverage of the conflict between Hamas and Israel. Stay tuned.